Hey everyone, welcome back. Summer's here, and living in Texas, I can't help but notice that there's an abundance of sunlight this time of year. It seems like a shame to let all of that free power go to waste, so in this video, I'll be building a solar-powered LoRa signal repeater. This concept could be used as the basis for creating a distributed LoRa mesh network if you have enough nodes, but even with just one repeater, it can already double the range of your LoRa signal. If you don't know what LoRa is already, it's a radio protocol that allows you to send data over a really good distance from some pretty low power devices. This alone makes it a good candidate for solar applications, but even if you're not interested in LoRa repeaters, you can still use the solar components in this video for anything really, whether you're doing garden automation or capturing time-lapse videos with an ESP32 cam, the hardware shown here can be applied to any of those projects. Generally speaking, the items we need are a solar panel, a battery, and the device we're trying to power. The device being powered really determines the battery capacity and size of the solar panel you'll need because it determines your overall energy consumption rate. The setup I'll be using should work for most embedded IoT devices including a couple of low power peripherals like sensors or a LoRa transceiver. So for example, this will easily handle most Arduino or ESP32 projects. But if you plan to run something more power hungry like a Raspberry Pi, you'll probably need to scale it up a bit. In terms of more precise energy budgeting, you'd want to calculate the combined milliamp hour consumption of your entire node. So that's the microcontroller and the peripherals running at whatever interval and capacity you need them to run at. And with that number, you know that you'll need a battery that can at least handle enough milliamp hours between available daylight, and you need a panel capable of collecting enough power during daylight hours so that you can keep the entire system online. For projects like this, my philosophy is that when in doubt, you should overestimate your energy budget. But that's also because I tend to repurpose and reuse my components from old projects, so having more capacity means more flexibility. Now, a lot of makers use these generic LiPo or lithium polymer battery packs with these little JST connectors because they're cheap and widely available. But they do have a few drawbacks. For instance, you can't directly connect these to a solar panel and charge them as is. It'll require a special charging circuit. Some boards have the charging circuit built in, like these Madduino LoRa boards or this DF Robot Fire Beetle, but not all microcontroller boards do. So you might need to grab some extra hardware, or if you're up for a project, you can definitely find some circuit diagrams for charging circuits online. Another drawback is that these JST connectors aren't really well standardized. I found LiPo batteries that have different polarizations, which means you really have to be careful connecting these to your devices, or you can do some serious damage. They're also fragile, and these connections tend to break unless the entire unit is really well secured. That's actually why I have duct tape on this one. And finally, the battery itself can easily be punctured, which can cause them to explode if the lithium inside them is exposed to air. For those reasons, I tend to avoid using the larger LiPo battery packs, and instead usually rely on dedicated power banks like this. Aside from just being more durable and generally larger capacity, they have the advantage of having the charging circuit built in. And since they supply power over a standardized USB interface, it'll just work for most devices as is. But you still have to be careful about the exact model of these power banks because they don't all function the same. For instance, some of these don't supply power while they're charging, like this one. That makes them effectively useless for solar projects. What you want to look for is a device that allows for pass-through charging, which means it can supply power while charging. Another issue is that some of them have a minimum current shutoff, so unless your device is drawing a certain amount of current, the battery will automatically shut itself off. This also makes them practically useless for low power solar projects like this. This battery, however, um, from a brand called Voltaic, is specifically made for solar applications. So not only does it support pass-through charging, it also specifies that it has an always-on mode, meaning it doesn't have a minimum current shutoff. I'll put a link in the description if you're interested. Now, as far as solar panels go, there are tons of options here. 
but my recommendation for a good general purpose panel is to aim for ones that output about 5 or 6 volts and at least 1 or 2 watts to charge a battery like this. This panel is 1 watt 6 volts and this panel is 5 watts 6 volts. And both of these are from Voltaic. Again, it really just depends on how much power your IoT device consumes. I'll be using the 5 watt one, but it's also overkill in this case because I could definitely get away with using the 1 watt panel. Still, with these kinds of projects, you have more flexibility if you overestimate. So if I wanted to add more peripherals, I don't feel too constrained. Now that I have a battery and panel picked out, all I have to do is plug in my LoRa device. But first, I need to write some code to make this function as a repeater. With these Madduino LoRa boards, this part is really easy because it's all just Arduino code using the popular Radiohead library. I showed how to write the transmit and receive parts in a previous video, which I'll link to at the end of this one. So this program will basically just be a combination of those two. So again, I'm using the Radiohead library to communicate with the LoRa transceiver, setting some of the pin constants for these Maduino boards, setting the LoRa frequency to be 915 MHz, which is the US standard, allocating a buffer big enough to temporarily hold one message. These functions are all something I added to control the specific LoRa radio parameters, since the Radiohead library doesn't really have a better way to customize these. I won't go into detail about these here, but um, if you're interested in the code, just let me know in the comments. Then the setup function basically just initializes the radio module with the parameters I want. And then down here in the loop, I've got it checking if a message is available, otherwise it returns immediately. Then it tries to receive the message. Then it sets the first byte to be zero. And I'm doing this as a way to flag that the message is being sent from the repeater. Because if the receiving node is close enough to the sending node, it will receive the original message directly and then after that, it'll receive a duplicate of the message from the repeater. But this way, all of the sending nodes will have a non-zero ID in that first byte, and the receivers can all ignore the original messages and just focus on the ones from the repeater. If you wanted to keep track of which node originally sent the message, even after being repeated, you would just encode that into the message body itself. And then down here, it tries to send the message. And that's it. That will effectively repeat the signal. For the transmitter, I'll have another Maduino LoRa board reading from one or more sensors and sending the readings over LoRa. And the sensors it's reading from could be anything. If the device is on the go, it could be reading the coordinates from a GPS module like this, which would allow you to do remote tracking. Or it could be reading temperature and humidity from an environmental sensor like this. Or you could make a remote security system and have it send a message whenever an infrared motion sensor is triggered like this one. There's a lot of possibilities here. Just remember that the sending node should set the first byte to be non-zero so that receivers know that the message isn't coming from the repeater. And for the receiver, I'll use another Maduino LoRa board, this time connected to a laptop. And this one will be programmed to listen for any LoRa messages and then repeat them to the laptop over the built-in USB serial connection. That way, I can use something like a Python script on the laptop to perform actions based on those incoming messages. For instance, I could write them to a database, upload them to the cloud somewhere, I could have them trigger node red or any other MQTT listeners. I mean, anything is possible really once you're able to process them from a Python script running on a laptop or even a Raspberry Pi. And the messages don't have to be unidirectional. Any of the nodes talking through the repeater could send and receive. They don't have to be one or the other. That means, for instance, it's possible to build an off-the-grid two-way text messaging system which is something I plan to do in a future video. There's a lot of potential here, and it wouldn't be difficult to add more solar-powered repeaters to extend the range even further. I had originally planned to do a distance test with this repeater, but we're still under a bunch of restrictions where I live from the, uh, you know, global pandemic. But really, the range should just be double that of my previous tests, or more if I change the default LoRa parameters to optimize it even further because it's really just sending the message again, so it does just double that range. Anyway, that's it for this video. I put links in the description for all of the parts, and I can add links to the source code too if anyone's interested in that.
While you're down there, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe if you're into this kind of content, and I will see you next time.